Today, on April 1st, I would like to announce my retirement from StarCraft 2. I know we've had a good run, the last decade has been a lot of fun, but the thing is, it's about time we start appealing to younger audiences. So, starting tomorrow, my channel will be exclusively dedicated to Minecraft, Roblox, League of Legends, Fortnite, FIFA, maybe a little bit of Call of Duty, I might even do some Dota if I feel like it, but... Yeah, it is what it is. Anyways, because of that, though, I figured let's go out with a bang. It's time for a best of three series of Terran versus Protoss between some of my favorite players in the world. The last game of StarCraft 2 that I'll ever be covering un until probably... Ooh, what are we doing? We're gonna go for a barracks right outside of the main base. All right, so spotting here in the top right-hand corner in game number one of this best of three series, playing with the Red Terran SCVs, we are looking at Clem's main command center. Immediately trying to be a little bit cheeky here. This is something that the Blue Protoss player will probably figure out pretty soon. Anyways, from uh, the United States of America, we are looking at Astrea's main nexus. Astrea, of course, one of my all-time favorites right now. I've casted quite a few of his games, and uh, yeah, there's no denying that he's a, a big fan of playing spicy games of StarCraft 2. Looking around the main base right now. He sees the double gas, he knows that there's a chance that those structures from the Terran player are on the other side. But is he really gonna freak out? Unlikely. He's gonna go for the cybernetic score right here at 20. And he'll probably be following it up right there with a Nexus on the low ground as well. So he does see right now that indeed there wasn't any reason to panic. But Clem apparently not satisfied with his whole shebang just yet. Now decides to add on a factory over here too. Now the main awkwardness, yeah exactly, are those add-ons, right? So usually you kind of like want to do some switching around here. And if your add-ons are gonna be... I mean, all of the Terran structures, I guess, all of the production structures are 3x3, three three, so you can still fit them in there, but... Things get a little bit messy, especially later on, if you want to, say, start pumping out a couple of those Vikings two at a time, and you want to switch around uh, the reactor right here that will usually be on the barracks. Anyhow, for now, Astrea, hiding the probe in the tall grass, trying to pretend to be a Pokémon, saving his Master Ball for the one, the only, the Probius. Mostly just wants to see if there's any units running by this position. Oh my god, Clem. <laughs> so Clem apparently is uh, feeling very feisty today, huh? Immediately goes for... Ooh, Astrea sees it. Perfect scout right there by Astrea. Uh, he immediately goes now for a starport proxy as well. I mean, ah, this doesn't even really count as a proxy, but at the very least he's going to be able to now complete the wall off over here, start pumping out a couple of Hellions, and then eventually go for a CC on the low ground too. I'm expecting this to be a... Okay, it actually got cancelled now with the Adept getting over there. I'm expecting this to be a uh, a Medivac start, I guess. That's what Clem was going for, but... Instead, right now, he's up with his back against the wall. Pretty terrible start right here for our Frenchman. Australia catching everything perfectly so far. He's gone for the Twilight Council, and now we're gonna go into the Robotics Facility as well. Is there a hole right there? No, there isn't. And obviously, this is the position you want to be in, right? So, by the way, as we'll be making this video, Astrea, the rank 1 from the United States of America. He is the rank 17 in the world overall. Clem, eh, not the best player from Europe, but he's the rank 5 in the world overall. Obviously, there's uh, quite a few good players uh, on the European region, or in the European region. Anyways, Hellions here at the front. I mean, yeah, it can kind of work, I suppose, but I like what Astrea is doing here. Tightening that wall even more, even though the Adept there did take a bunch of damage. The Stalker is going to be able to stop this. I'm fairly certain the Stalker on uh, on hold position right there could have prevented this from dealing any damage in the first place anyways. But Astrea playing super safe. Additional Stalkers are coming up. Blink is coming up as well. I think Astrea just wants to go for a relatively quick third here too. I mean, I think that's a good idea. Especially with Terran only just now finishing up the natural. Alright. So, where do you go from here if you're Clem, right? So, you are behind. You tried playing uh, a tricky game of StarCraft 2 against a very tricky Protoss player, and he read you like a book. Oh my god, did you see that? He just moonwalked, I don't know, like 20 degrees sideways. He just rotated on his axis. Am I crazy? Fairly certain that's what he did. Anyways, Stalker right here at the front, also poking and prodding. Making sure that he knows roughly what's going on. I think he's gonna have to pay for this with his life. Oh, uh, never mind. Prism is going to be here to pick it up. And honestly, this is going to be an extremely hard situation to be in right now for uh, for Mr. Klemdo. So you can go for a full all-in here if you are Astrea. 
Which is definitely not a bad option. Alternatively though, yeah, you can just go for the third nexus and try some pressure here. So the prism will probably provide the high ground vision here that Australia needs to get into the main base. Either that or you can just blink on top of the siege tank right here in the natural. I do think there was a potential here to just commit to like eight gateways and just go for a full-on all-in here as the Protoss player. But Estrella, okay, trying to play a smart game. Yeah, not the perfect micro over there. Hellion's over here on the other side of the map also trying to get some work done, but there's no way they're gonna burn one of those Nexi down. I mean, a Nexus is basically built of, I don't know, pure gold with aluminum and like, I don't know what, the, I don't know what, the, maybe it's actually, it's kind of, it's kind of brownish. Maybe it's more like copper or bronze or, I don't know. Anyways, I don't know, metals. I guess you can color the other metals too. It's fine. This is a bad situation though right now actually for Estrella. I don't like this spot whatsoever. I was already talking as if this game was mostly over here, but Estrella decided to like walk all of his units into a corner right there. Losing an awful lot of Stalkers there for what seemed essentially free. I mean, obviously, he did kill quite a few of those Terran units too, but... There's now no longer... It doesn't... Hmm, it doesn't actually look anymore like Estrella is in that good of a spot right here. Obviously, he does have that economical advantage, sure. But the army advantage that he had earlier... That's sort of gone. SCVs right there soaking up a, uh, yeah, quite, a, quite a lot of those shots, and... Things are looking quite a bit better right now here. For our Frenchman. That being said... He's still gonna have to play a defensive game for the time being. Stimpak and Combat Shield are done, so maybe he can roam the map with like, I don't know, like a, a Medivac or two. But yeah, where do you go from here if you're Terran, right? So he decides to go for the third command center, which is the safest of the, uh, the, safest of the options. Once again, inviting the Protoss player to come to you. Again, alternatively, he could have gone for additional production structures. I feel like if Australia decided to go for seven gateways or eight gateways and just warp in a ton of stalkers, he probably could have won here. Anyways, instead, those gateways are coming up right now. And he's decided to go into the Stormy Boy upgrade, okay. So High Templar will probably be added into the mix here soon enough. There's one of them already. High Templar have two skills that are really good. First off, they have feedback. Not as spicy as the second skill, called Psionic Storm. That basically just deals a whole lot of damage in an area of effect. Uh, feedback is an ability that I actually do get questions about quite a bit. So, it does two things. First off, you can deal damage to the enemy units by hitting them up with the... What's it called? Like, the, the ability. So, basically, you target the opponent's spellcasters. And at that point, they take damage based off of the amount of energy that they have. Does that make any sense? Anyways, it's really good. Oh, all right. One of the observers, apparently, of this uh, of this game, asking if anyone else was lagging. Um, so basically, what you do is you just the way that pro players use it usually, right? Feedback that is. I don't think we're gonna see it in this particular game. I mean, maybe against the Metavex. But usually, what you do is you set up a rapid fire command for the feedback hotkey. So in my case, for example, I use hotkey Z for that. And what you do at that point is you select the High Templar, you hold down hotkey Z. And then you just wave over whatever spellcaster you find. That's usually the way that it's done, um, especially against, like, say, for example, like Zerk Vipers or units that really need to be feedbacked. Anyways, I don't think it's going to be too particularly uh, relevant for this game. Uh, against Terran, I mean, unless they have a couple of, I don't know, like Ravens in the mix or something. Um, yeah, you usually do go for that Storm instead. Honestly, the fact that Clem made a game out of this is pretty awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of Siege Tanks over there. A couple of Widow Mines in the mix as well. Terran Bio Army right now going towards the left side of the map. Astrea setting up a transition here towards a Stargate-based army as well. He's thinking about going for a fourth base. Uh, this shows what happens, though, when you give Clem uh, a bit of an opportunity, right? Small misplay right there from Astrea. Overextending with the Stalkers, thinking he was further ahead than he actually was, and... Oh! Oh, Storm Drops! I love the fact he actually uh, dropped him one over there. Okay, we're gonna try again. Mule ends up finding death over here. Jimmy wants to see if the fourth base from the Protoss player is taken on the right side of the map. Usually it's taken right here on the left. And actually, Astrea checking if Jimmy is gonna be checking for the... Anyways. <laughs> Eventually, though. Oh my god. He got sliced in half. Eh. It's a quick death. 
Anyways, there we go. So we have the Fleet Beacon coming up and then also double Stargate, or I guess triple Stargate in total. And then we are also going into that plus one flyer attack. This does mean, though, yeah, that for the time being, I mean, Protoss just invested like a thousand resources into things that aren't going to be useful yet. He's in a bit of a vulnerable position. Okay, High Templars do get saved here. Great opportunity right now for Clem to move forward, though. Uh, we do need that army over here, I think. This is honestly going to be the scariest point in the game, I think, for Astrea. Astrea has been in a good spot for the majority of this match, mostly because of the way that Clem decided to start things off. But until those carriers actually hit the battlefield and until those upgrades are done, this is not going to be an easy game. Okay. Clem's setting up a very nice position over here. Trying to keep that army as spread out as possible. Okay, Zealots actually take a ton of damage. That being said, a couple of Zealots right now coming in from the north as well. My main question is, is there going to be enough Protoss, though, to stop all of this from advancing? Storms over here, okay, are pretty decent. Okay, now that one was very juicy. And eventually, it looks like Estrella does force the lift. Oh, my God. I could have sworn that Medivac would have gotten shot at. Or would have gotten shot at right there by one of those last stalkers. Anyways, it manages to stay alive. But Clem's reinforcements are also already here. He's still got a good lead, but now carriers are being built. I think the first one's already out. Yes. Once you have enough carriers, life's going to be pretty easy. At this point, obviously, there's not that many High Templar anymore either. As a matter of fact, yeah, there's only two, but they don't have any energy. Honestly, if Clem just puts his, uh, his foot down on the gas right now, I think he might actually obtain the victory right here, right now. Okay, well... Those Widow Mines also not particularly great for the Terran, but most of the Zealots are already gone. Carriers are popping out, but Carriers also only spawn with four Interceptors. They have to pay and, well, spend a little bit of time building it, so yeah, Astrea understandably decides to give up on that expansion. In the meantime, at the 12 o'clock position, Terran already has their fourth base up and running. Very impressive stuff right here from, uh, from the Frenchman here, though. The fact that he actually managed to crawl himself back into this match is, uh... It's not easily done, but he did do it very well. Obviously, there is still a chance, though, that Estrella can accidentally overwhelm the opponent here. I mean, we're talking 19 Marines, which is quite a bit, but a lot of them are sprinkled around the map. Interceptors obviously have a tendency to just, well, gain a massive tempo advantage, right? So you do need a ton of Marines, and I like what, uh, what Mr. Clem is doing here. Making all the right moves, adding on more and more of those uh, those Marines as well. They're only at plus one, though, so the upgrades are actually quite quite late. But yeah, I think Estrella's best bet right now is just to go for, like, a, a Death Bowl. Well, that ain't it. Okay. Good bait right there on the Storm. There's not enough energy right here on this High Templar. It's still about 10 seconds away. Another High Templar trying to come in from the back, but that Widow Mine made short work of it as well. <laughs> now you're just styling on him, Clem. Yeah, that was a significant lead right there by Estrella that was given away in the earlier stages of the game. Those Stalkers getting caught off guard was definitely not what you're looking for. And right now, I think Terran is getting an extremely good trade over here. Marauders in the front. There's the battery overcharge, of course, but the Interceptors are being destroyed, right? So, Interceptors have 40 uh, shields and 40 health. Yeah, the battery tried to keep everything alive, but it's not enough. Klim actually wins game number one. All right. So, while this replay was loading, I was just looking out of my window for a second. And, I mean, this is completely unrelated to StarCraft 2. But, um, interestingly enough, last week, I was sitting outside in a t-shirt. It was like 22 degrees Celsius. I think that's like, what is that? Like 72, 73 Fahrenheit-ish for my American viewers. And right now, as of me making this video, it's literally snowing. Nice April Fool's joke right here from uh, Mother Nature, I guess. <laughs> Anyways. Kind of wild how there's a, uh, like, 25 degree difference in just a few days' time. I think I... So we went we went rock climbing, right? I, I do rock climbing usually once or twice a week. And um, we went outside for the first time this season, last Sunday. And it was, like, really hot. Oh. I guess we're gonna get another first time. <laughs> Anyways, what do we do right here, Mr. Australia? Probably not too happy after that first game. Clem was like, I want to put myself far behind. 
And Australia was like, awesome. Let me give it back to you. A little unfortunate. Excellent timings right there by Clem, though. Sniffing out the transition that his opponent was going for. I mean, the problem is when you add on, like, three Stargates, a Fleet Beacon, you start up the plus one Flyer attack, and you make a carrier, right? Like, the Stargates are 150, 150 each, and then the Fleet Beacon is, like, a million, right? Roughly. At least that's what it feels like. And then you gotta pay for the 100, 100 for the upgrade as well, and then you start up the carrier, which is really expensive. So we're, th we're talking literally thousands of resources that Australia had tied up in things that were gonna be helpful in, like, three minutes from now. But, or from then, I guess. But, yeah, it, it didn't really work out there. And Clem sniffed out exactly what he was going up against. Probably confirmed it with a scan as well. And then realized, wait a second, I can go across the map. Probably kill you. Alright. Where are we going to go from here, Mr. Estrella? What are we going to do? So, rather than actually protecting the little jump up pad right over here. That we see a lot of Protoss players focus on. Apparently, Estrella is going to try and, like wall off this side of his own base so i guess this is probably a full wall off over here yeah i guess reapers can only really go around like that anyways clem sending the first reaper across right now building a bunker inside of the opponent's natural this is obviously not that big of a commitment but i like what clem is doing actually building it right there between the nexus as well as the pylon so the surface area there for that scv to be attacked was actually quite uh, quite small so you don't really have that much surface area right pop in yeah, there you go. <laughs> Clem just being as annoying as he can be. <laughs> I like the little mini games here. He's trying to time the shots between the stalker. Yeah, look at that. That's actually a wasted shot. So interestingly enough, that shot disappears. It's one of the top 10 things that science can't explain. Anyways, eventually the SCV does, uh, does go down. Bunker here? You shouldn't let it... Okay, I was gonna say, you shouldn't let it salvage. If you salvage it, Darren gets 75% of their resources back. Which is pretty good. Right now, uh, Clem actually had to make a bit of an investment there. Eventually, good defense right there, though. By our Protoss player. Pulling the appropriate amount of probes. Clem uh, just having a little bit of fun. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. If you time it really well... So that's one of the downsides, right, from playing online. If you time it really well, you can, like, micro against quite a few units in StarCraft 2 just by... Picking them up at the perfect moment. In StarCraft 1, for example, I think all of the offline tournaments are using LAN. And it basically gives you like zero milliseconds of delay, right? For all intents and purposes anyways. Pretty much zero. Meaning that, uh, yeah, you can pull off some crazy micro tricks. In StarCraft 2, I think with, with zero ping, that, you know, could be some really beautiful things you could, you could pull off. It would be nice to see. Anyways. Most of the tournaments, of course, in StarCraft 2, though, they do happen online. I can imagine that's actually the case for StarCraft 1 as well, though. The biggest ones, of course, are played in an offline setting. Same for StarCraft 2, but I know a lot of the offline tournaments also still use, like, the Battle.net servers. Anyways. Blink opener once again here from our Protoss. And we've got ourselves a bit of a Widow Mind drop coming up right now. I'm fairly certain the Hallucination just now saw that Medivac. Alright, so this time around it's going to be a heavy focus on a ground-based army with double forts instead. Terran transitioning towards that good old bio mid-game. I'm expecting a tech lab right there on the second fact- or sorry, the second barracks as well, or I guess the third one. But the second one with a tech lab. To go into the stim pack uh, and the combat shield at the same time. Stalkers already preparing themselves for the medevac. Yeah, sometimes you don't even really need to see the medevac drop, right? Like, as long as you know that there's the potential for one, and you kind of scout out roughly what they're going for, you should always have the units split up. There's no reason to have all of your stalkers in one big bowl. The medevac is just going to kind of chill and hope for an anti-timing right down the right side of the map. It's not getting too hot in there, even though he's flying right above lava. Stalkers here at the front, trying to see if they can get some sort of work done. But mostly this is just to, yeah, snipe whatever they can, right? All right. Third Nexus, up and running. Six additional gateways here coming up. I'm expecting a third command center here pretty soon as well from the Terran player. Either that, or you can, you know, go for a bit of a move out. Matter of fact, drop inside of the main base. Okay, Widow Mines, Widow Mines, Widow Mines! This could so backfire. Okay. Yeah, you can try and target fire there with the Terran units, but it's obviously a little bit tricky. 
Nice defense there, though, all things considered. And now these units are actually going to go down as well. Excellent body blocking right there by Estrella, man. I really like Estrella's building positioning. So the Medivac right there came in to try and at least get a few of those uh, Widow Mines out of there. But I think Estrella plugged a Stalker in between those structures on purpose to prevent that from happening. Looks like the Medivac will be able to escape with only 18 health. All right. Anyway, Starin, finishing up Stimpak, finishing up Combat Shield, finishing up plus one Infantry Web. Well, actually, no. That one's actually kind of late. But there's the third CC. Building it on position. Always kind of surprises me how many Terran players just, you know, <laughs> stick with this 100%. I know at the pro level, the little flight from over here to over there might make a difference. But honestly, if you're a, a ladder Terran player, and you're anywhere below Grandmaster League, I honestly think you should just build the command center right over here and just, you know, fly it in there. Because the amount of games, especially viewers submitted games where I see players just losing the base that they're building on location, I mean, it happens more so than it doesn't happen, you know? Like, it's... I mean, Protoss, you kind of have to, right? You can't float your Nexus, but you may as well make use of that Terran mechanic. All right. So, Glittering Ash is obviously a huge map, and you can see that the, it's, it's already affecting this game quite a bit, right? So both players are, yeah, looking to be aggressive, but since the units just simply spent so much time marching across, it's quite hard to actually, yeah, get a proper fight in. At this point as well, Astraea actually, without like a prism... Ay, ay, ay. See, I was just talking about this. I don't think it's gonna die, though. Nah, a couple additional SCVs right now are gonna finish the job. But it's so risky, right? Great force fields right there by Estrella. So Estrella can't really reinforce this very effectively, other than, like, warping in units at the third, and then, yeah, walking them towards this army. Careful now, Mr. Estrella. Ooh, okay. Turning around, creating some room there. I like it. Clem already realized, though, what was going on there. Started hanging a little bit further back. Yeah, look at the minefield. These are laid down right here just for the, the Zealots. You really want to try... Well, I mean, any any Protoss unit is welcome to walk into it. But once you get rid of the Zealots, the rest of the Protoss army is quite vulnerable. So a very gateway-heavy approach here, right? So that's usually what we see when we go for the double forges, which I really like. Going straight into 2-2. Two -two. Now we're going to go into the Robotics Bay. Second Robo facility as well. Okay. So that gives them the opportunity to go, well, for a bunch of upgrades right in the Robo Bay. But more importantly, the opportunity right here to go for a couple of, say, Colossi or a few Disruptors or whatever he likes. Both should be pretty good here. Usually with a Stalker Heavy Army, it seems that a lot of Protoss players are very keen to go for, like, a, a bunch of Disruptors. This is going to be one hell of a timing attack here once again from Klemdo. Oh, Zealots, Zealots, Zealots! Oh, okay. Only about three of them end up going down there. Yeah, great kiting right here by Clem, right? Just not allowing those units to touch. And now that all of the Widow Mines are on cooldown, guess what? Time to go back. Well, he wants to go back, but... The best he can hope for right now is the high ground, I guess. Hello. Are we not? Okay. That was some very slow reaction time right there by Mr. Clem. Decides to load up at least the leftover units inside of Metavex to try and get on out of there. He was probably busy looking at other things. Anyways, double Colossus right now coming up. Wouldn't be surprised to see the extent of Thermal Lens research as well. It's going to give those Colossi some additional range. I think it's plus three. I think it goes from like six to nine range or something like that. Anyways, makes them much better against the Terran bio units. Especially against Widowmine based armies as well. Terran going into 2-2 right now. I would love to see, yeah, plus three right away here from Astrea. All of those upgrades are super expensive though. He needs to not forget about the extended thermal lens. He probably wants to make more Colossi as well. Because otherwise you may as well just go single. So he needs, he needs a lot of gas here. Yeah, so there's a third Colossus. So we're going to go four Colossi without ranged. Oh, good force field over here. Once again by Estrella, though. Snaps a bunch of those. Ooh, yeah, nicely done. He actually kills a bunch of those Widow Mines there very easily. Darren doesn't have the Drilling Claws research yet. I mean, I know it got nerfed, Clem. I know the Drilling Claws isn't as potent as it once was, but... Probably not a bad idea. One Marauder, by the way, stuck over there. So I guess, yeah, we're going to free it. Okay, there's the extended thermal lens. I would love to see the plus two or the plus three armor coming up too and just more zealots. 
He's decided to only go for a few gases over at his third base, but like his natural is out and his main base. Like he's only got four gas in total, so very zealot heavy army here from our protals. So that's why I guess the attack upgrade is the most important one. Speaking of which, yeah, when you have this much economy, you may as well try. A couple of units inside of the main base. Looks like the prism may have very well... No, actually, the prism is probably still alive. Yeah, it is. Okay, anyways, he kills the command center. Prism. Dude, that is pretty much impossible to see on the minimap. Am I crazy? I still don't see it, even though, like, it's right there. Anyways. Fifth Nexus coming up after the scan wears off. Clem just doing the Terran thing, right? Playing very slow and steady. Trying to make sure that he doesn't die. But honestly, losing that fourth CC right there was pretty painful. He's gonna go into a new one right now. But this wasn't even Astrea's final form, right? Okay. Once again, Zealots in the main base dealing a lot of damage over here. Viking does pop out, probably needs to turn around. Clem moving backwards right now, trying to go towards the safety of that, uh, well, that wall off that he created for himself. But obviously, that's exactly where those Colossi shine. Only a couple of Vikings in the air for now. I would love to see the Stalkers, yeah, target fire those down. Because as soon as the Vikings are out of the equation, I mean, the Marauders do decently well, but everything else just kind of dies. Anyways, while that was all happening, the Zealots were still slicing and dicing whatever they can inside of the main base. 30 SCVs have already gone down. And this is going from bad to worse right now from Clem. Now, Clem showed some really good gameplay in game number one, though. Coming back from a disadvantage. This time around? Hmm. Got a feeling that it's not going to be easy. Australia's economy is booming. I like this low gas double forge approach a lot. I think it's very fun to play. The very zealot heavy army. I mean, I mostly play Zerk myself, right? So I guess, you know, with this style, you make so many zealots that it kind of feels like your zealots are Zerklings. <laughs> so it's a very swarmy proto style. But I, I am a fan of it. I think it's really fun. Careful, careful. Okay, nice split right there by Estrella. So easy to accidentally get all of your units affected by that. All right. A few SCVs are being rebuilt in the main base. Seven more Stalkers are coming up, though. I'm fairly certain Australia wants to go in for the kill here. Yeah, he needs a new prism once again. There's one Dark Templar somewhere. Okay. That one's walking across the map right now, too. Disruptors trying to get some work done. Okay, a couple of the Terran units right there do get killed, but nice concave right there by Clem. Careful, though. Ooh, Clem is so good at controlling these armies still, right? His micro is honestly so impressive. <laughs> I swear Clem was dead, guys. I swear he's died several times in this series. I mean, supply-wise, this is still not a good situation here for the Terran at all, but... Oh, yeah, second scan force there as well. That Dark Templar right there accepted its fate at the end, right? But if it kills a bunch of Terran units, maybe a few SCVs, I know it killed at least a Marine. Forcing out two scans is pretty good. Yeah, one Zealot for a Widow Mine is a trait that Australia will take. He's adding on more Colossi once again. The problem is when you're going up against Colossi, you really do need more Vikings. And if the Vikings are killed every time during every battle, it kind of sucks. Because Vikings are quite expensive. Okay, one Viking once again falls. Nice snipes here, though, by the Terran player as well. Clem, all of a sudden on the aggression, or on the offensive. Those ghosts are so nice, right? Yeah, he's just trying to snipe whatever he can. If you've got energy, you may as well. Colossus coming in from the high ground right now. Awkwardly rallied in here from Astrea. That's definitely a misery. One Marine over here on the right side of the map apparently has been tasked with killing a Nexus. Colossus, though. Ugh. Sliding down. Okay. Sorry. I'm very nosy. Oh, I guess one of the... I guess one of the observers started lagging. Anyways. Massive amount of Dark Templar right now. Inside of the main base. Dealing so much damage, even if you have vision. Yeah, those guys don't care, man. Their DPS is the highest in the game, if I'm not mistaken. And when they're actually fighting, 
just seeing them is not enough. <laughs> you need to have, like, something to kill them as well. So apparently, Vikings are going to be some of it. Anyways, love the way to destroy a place, man. Good stuff. So eventually, all of those units will once again go down. 110 zealots have been killed, by the way, this game. It's quite a lot. Klemdo did secure a new base, right? So he is now at 5cc, which is awesome. Plus, all of those command centers on Glittering Ashes are on a high ground, right? So you have a lot of ramps to defend. Clem doesn't have a sensor tower over here, so he doesn't actually see the movement here of the Protoss. That kind of sucks. Love to see a sensor tower over there, but obviously in these sort of scenarios, you gotta choose your poison, I guess. When you're in a rough spot. Skipping sensor towers is one way to save yourself a little bit of money and potentially come back. Okay, here we go. Astraea trying to see if he can go in for killer move number three. So far, it's not happened yet. One purification nova can change everything. Okay, that one was going in the wrong direction. Not entirely sure about that. Okay, nice movement right there by Astraea. Now baiting those Vikings to go further forward than they were originally planning on. Yeah, it's just that the Protoss army right here is growing at a very rapid pace. Ten additional zealots added into the mix. And he's just happily expending. Yeah. Eventually, Terran should run out of money, right? In theory, <laughs> this should be a win right here for Australia. Clemdo, extremely resilient. Okay. Forced to deal with a bunch of Dark Templar right there, and he loses two command centers, and that's too much. Okay, GG is cold, and Australia does win game number two. Okay, so, Curious Minds. That's gonna be our final map for today. Smallest map in the current map pool. Obviously, a couple of days ago, we saw Mr. Classic pull off some very cheeky openers, specifically on this map. He basically decided to go, so say, for example, he would have spawned in the bottom section of the map. He decided to go for a pylon right over here. In case you're interested in checking out those games, I'll go ahead and post a link to it down below in the description of this one, so you can go watch it after this one ends. Either way, that was some hyper-aggression right there from Mr. Classic. A lot of StarCraft 2 players have started killing the Roombas, not because they hate the critters, but because they can actually block your structures. So sometimes when you're in a panic, right? You're seeing like, okay, the Terran army's coming in, there's Hellions coming up, I need to complete the wall off! Then there's a freaking Roomba, like a little cleaning robot right there, trying to, yeah, just do its job. And sometimes it can actually block your structures. This is, uh... It's probably happened to every single StarCraft II player at a high level, at least once. And ever since then, I guess they uh, have some sort of stress disorder where they, <laughs> they need to kill every single one of them when they're in that area on the map. Anyways. Everyone knows, though, it brings bad luck, right? To kill the cleaning bot. It's not a good thing to do. Sometimes map makers do get a little carried away adding those things on, but I... I kind of like it. The pro players don't like them, though. The pro players are like, no, 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 I just want to play on an undecorated map. Preferably with the most standard layout that we've seen. If it was up to pro players, I guess we'd still be playing Metalopolis or like Zalnaga Caverns or something, you know? Like, we'd, <laughs> we'd be playing the Wings of Liberty maps uh, from like early Wings of Liberty map. Or from, from, like, the early stages of Wings of Liberty, just because... Well, those were the best maps that we had back then. Really? We're gonna do this again, Mr. Clem. So, he's building this right outside of the main base of the Protals. Obviously, there is a lot of airspace in between. You can actually go in there very easily. It's a very curious zealot right over here. Will the zealot be curious enough, though? I mean, it is a curious mind, after all. Ha ha ha! Professional commentator. Yeah, this is so annoying, right? Usually zealots aren't made this early on. But it's working out quite well, and honestly, this could backfire really hard with the like the factory on the other side of the map. I guess Glenn wants to go for a starport over here too. But like, he needs to make some units at home, so he's pumping out a few marines at once. Command center on the low ground is not done yet. He decides to go for a second factory, or sorry, a second barracks over here instead. 
Honestly, this could backfire so hard right now. Oh my god. We're just gonna make one Hellion here? Yeah, that's not what he was intending on going for at all. Astraea also wondering here where those units are. He's like, wait, are, where, where is going on? So one Hellion here, okay, maybe it can deal some sort of counter-attack damage. CC on the low ground, still not finished. Oh my god, is this how the series is gonna end? Because this is honestly dealing too much. So we do see four probe kills right here on one Hellion, by the way. That's not supposed to happen. Okay, eventually this will be... Hmm. Actually, I guess Clem can stabilize from here. The fact that we just saw four... Hmm. Alright, four probes or five probes being killed by one Hellion is pretty wild. Hellion number two has shown up as well. I didn't think they were going to kill anything. Australia probably a little too busy microing on the other side of the map to get more units out. Okay, eventually this will be shut down. So where are we at? Oh, wow. Well, um, I guess Clem was asking himself the same question. <laughs> Nothing really happened here, right? Like, the, he was kind of processing the loss at this point? Yeah. No, nothing really happened. Okay, so... He cleans this up. Definitely an early GG right there for Mr. Clem. Don't get me wrong. So that Hellion in the natural gets killed. He realizes my, my SCVs right there couldn't mine for the longest time. This one gets destroyed, and at that point he's like, Okay, I, I guess I've got very little to live for at this point in the game. That's a, bit, a little bit sad. Okay, so this is the situation. So in StarCraft 2, you can be ahead in a couple of different ways. First off, you can be ahead economically. Secondly, you can be ahead with the army. And lastly, you can be ahead in the tech, right? Those are like the main pillars of StarCraft 2. I mean, some people will argue that there's more than that. But anyways, what I'm trying to get at is that Estrella is currently ahead in army. He's currently ahead in economy. And he's currently ahead in tech. There's no starport. There's no follow-up pressure here whatsoever. So Clem could obviously be playing another game here for like the next 10 minutes from behind. And I honestly would have liked him to see the, you know, I would have liked to see him doing that. Uh, but I guess in his mind, it's like, okay, I, there's absolutely no way that I can obtain the victory from here. So I guess I'll just GG. Anyways, guys, tomorrow um, we're going to do one of those really stupid um, FIFA loot box unboxing videos where I'm going to spend all of my YouTube earnings on buying those booster packs and hopefully we get a Messi. I don't know. I don't know how FIFA works. Is, is that what you guys do when you play FIFA? At least that's what I've heard. Honestly, FIFA must be like the most earning franchise in all of the gaming industry, right? The fact that you like have to pay for a full box AAA title every year for what is like 98% the same game. And you also have to buy stuff if you want to play all... It's, it's kind of crazy. EA. <laughs> Those guys have... They've been having a blast with FIFA for a couple decades right now.